Alright, last time we left off, John Blunt had just found a new way for the South Sea Company to make money. And since the company still wasn't making a single cent in the South Sea, it was time for him to roll the dice on perhaps one of the most ambitious financial schemes in history. He was going to take on the now impossibly large 31 million pound unconsolidated debt that the government had racked up by 1719. If successful, this would, beyond any doubt, make the eight-year-old South Sea Company the biggest financial institution in the world. It would also make anybody associated with the South Sea Company wealthy on a scale we can't even comprehend today. We covered this a bit last time, but just to refresh, the scheme was this. The government would allow the South Sea Company to issue an amount of stock equal to the value of the debt. How much stock that was would be calculated off whatever the share price was at the time the law was passed. So, for example, if the government's debt had been £10,000 and the South Sea Company stock had been worth £10 a share, they'd have been allowed to issue 1,000 new shares of stock. £10,000 of government debt, £10,000 worth of stock. The South Sea Company would then offer debt holders the opportunity to exchange their government debt for that stock, which would have seemed like a pretty good deal to those debt holders at the time, given how successful the South Sea Company appeared. The catch was that the South Sea Company would offer debt holders to exchange their debt for the current value of the stock. This means that if the price of South Sea stock continued to rise, they wouldn't have to trade as much stock for the debt as the government had calculated, allowing them to sell off the rest of the stock at market value and just keep the profit for themselves. So, say those hypothetical £10 shares happen to increase in value to £20 each. The company would only have to sell 500 of their new 1,000 shares to cover the government debt now, after which they could just pocket the extra money they made selling off the rest. That's a pretty good scheme, and with a staggering 31 million pounds of debt on the market, the possibilities here are ludicrous. If they could even manage to raise their share price by a single pound, it could possibly net them a return on a scale of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Today, the equivalent value would easily be somewhere in the tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. But before they could rake in the money with such a scheme, they needed to convince the government to let them consolidate the debt. And by convince, I mostly mean bribe. With so much potential profit at stake, the size of those bribes were set to match, with individual members of parliament receiving upwards of a million dollars in today's money for their vote. But when the then-Chancellor of the Exchequer, John Aislaby, presented it to parliament, parliament just sat there silent. The proposal was nearly too ludicrous for anybody who hadn't been generously bribed to take in. But, inevitably, when they recovered from the shock of the proposal, rather than reject it outright, they simply started to debate whether the debt should go to John Blunt's South Sea Company, or perhaps instead to the Bank of England. As these were both Whig-controlled institutions at this point, it was really just a matter of getting the best deal. For some, that meant the best deal for the government, and for others, it was the best deal for them, personally. As this wrangling was occurring, Blunt thought up an even better way of incentivizing members of Parliament to see his way. Instead of straight up bribing people, which was A, far more dangerous to do, B, sometimes required cash up front, and C, didn't give them any long-term benefit, Blunt struck on the idea of selling MPs stock, with the special caveat that they only had to pay for the stock upon its sale. This required no cash from the South Sea Company, was arguably illegal if you wildly stretch your interpretation of the law, and meant that the MPs only made money if South Sea stock rose, which would hopefully keep them interested in seeing it continue to rise. Even more beneficial, as these new high-ranking officials were seen publicly buying into the South Sea Company, it convinced a number of other officials and members of Parliament to actually buy in as well. There was only one last point of opposition to overcome, and that was Robert Walpole, a man Blunt had previously gotten locked up. Walpole wanted to have the government set the price at which shares could be exchanged for debt, regardless of their eventual market value. This would have completely destroyed the profit potential of Blunt's whole scheme. Blunt's manipulation of the House of Commons won out in the end, though, and the deal ultimately went through with slightly more favorable terms for the government and the South Sea Company paying a few million pounds for the privilege the South Sea Company got the right to consolidate the remaining unconsolidated government debt. Walpole didn't totally lose out, though. Behind the scenes, even he had been picking up cheap government debt in anticipation of the share swap. He wasn't going to let something petty like getting locked up in the Tower of London keep him from making a little money out of this. Throughout this process, everything was coming up roses for Blunt and the South Sea Company. By March, the share price had risen to £330. By April, though, the company's share price began to slide, and Blunt couldn't have that. After all, the company's only source of revenue was an increasing share price, so he stepped in with yet another ingenious scheme. He offered to sell the stock in the same way you might a used car. 
20% down and regular payments on the remainder every two months, which allowed people to buy far more stock than they could actually afford. Unlike a used car, though, the stock price could go up, and so long as it did, all people had to do was sell their purchased stock every two months, and they could cover their initial purchase and keep the profit. This resulted in many people owning five times as much South Sea stock as they could actually pay for. And when they did profit, much as Blunt expected, many of them simply reinvested whatever they made to do it all again in the next two months. This helped push the price of South Sea stock even higher. And by the time the Royal Seal was on the debt swap agreement, the share price had risen to a ludicrous 550 pounds. Now, technically, this agreement, the South Sea Act, explicitly forbid Blunt from selling more stock until the company began to trade its stock for debt. But since most of Parliament and the King himself were making a killing, nobody seemed to remember this clause at the time. As the weeks wore on, though, despite all of these shenanigans, the share price began to waver. So Mr. Blunt proposed to the board of the South Sea Company yet another novel plan. Why don't we use all this profit we've made to lend money to people wanting to buy South Sea stock? They were going to offer loans of up to £3,000 to individuals looking to buy into the South Sea Company. This is getting really close to the point of paying people to buy their stock. But it had the desired effect, and the stock continued to rise. Seeing the meteoric rise of the South Sea Company, everybody wanted to get into the stock market game. Companies all over Britain began selling stock to raise capital. Some of these were legitimate enterprises, which were established to develop sections of the British economy that hadn't taken off yet, simply due to lack of capital. Others offered such exciting products as a device to draw the vapors out of human brains, or a flying machine to be developed in the near future. But as Blunt finally began to actually convert the government debt to South Sea stock, the government, probably at the behest of Blunt and crew, began to crack down on these new ventures. You see, if money was being invested in these other new ventures, it meant there was less money to invest in the South Sea Company. That's the staggering scale that South Sea is at by this point. They have to worry that there is not enough money in the entire country to support their share price and have other companies on the market. So, in a feat of unfathomable irony, to defend the profitability of the South Sea Company, the government began to close down those other startups for unwarrantable practices. Unfortunately, this had the opposite effect that Blunt desired. As these other companies failed, the people who invested in them lost a great deal of money and began to sell their South Sea stock in order to cover their debts. But for right now, the stock was still on the rise overall, and with no rivals on the market and a fresh injection of loans from Blunt, South Sea shares skyrocketed from £503 to £830 apiece over the course of a week. Yet all was not actually well for South Sea. Between the copious bribes, the annuity payments, the loans, and the dividends, South Sea had spent over £8.5 million over a handful of months. And because many people were only paying 20% of their share price for their shares now, the company had little in reserve. Despite the shaky state of things behind the scenes, Blunt was given a knighthood in June and made a baronet. And the South Sea Company made plans to move to opulent new offices down the street from its old rival, the Bank of England. Soon the company would be valued at close to 300 million pounds, 10 times the amount of government debt they were originally supposed to take on. And due to the loans and the low money down share price offers, they would be owed about 60 million pounds, more than the total amount of money in the economy of Britain. Just to put this in perspective, if a company had that ratio of valuation to national economy in the modern day US, it would be worth 85 trillion dollars. Apple, the highest valued company in the world right now, is sitting at about two thirds of one trillion. And they actually make money. As you might have guessed, the center cannot hold. This type of fanciful madness can only be sustained for so long. And even as the company is reaching its peak, people are beginning to realize just how out of kilter things really are. Join us next time to watch the bubble burst and to see the consequences for our reputable Mr. Blunt and all the other players.